Hey everyone, uh, welcome to day two of the Young Scholar Program. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a few more minutes because I know we had like the last presentation before this one. So I'm just going to give people a few more minutes to join in, obviously um, coming from the other one, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Maybe in like two or three minutes we'll start this presentation then. Okay, so just in the interest of time, um, since I'm trying to, since I will need to like actually finish these slides and it might take a little while for that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started now. And thank you guys, like once again, for the people who joined in, and you know a lot of people just joined in. Thank you guys for coming to the second day of the YSP 2022 program. And I'm gonna get started. And for those of you guys, if you're joining in a little bit late, or if anyone you know is joining in a little bit late, then we, as always, we will have all these slides all the information, all of the, the actual presentation itself will be recorded as well. So you don't don't feel like you're missing anything. You can always go back look at the recordings, look at anything that you want for this. So actually, uh, let me actually start sharing my screen. Wow. Okay. Let that load it. So uh, today, my talk is going to be on introduction to Unix and Linux. And some of you guys might know what Unix and Linux are. You might have some familiarity with it. Some of you guys probably never, might have never heard about it before, but I'll walk you guys through it, an introduction, some of what it's about and what it's used for. So as always, with all presentations, we have this sort of disclaimer that we have. Um, and the disclaimer... Yeah, and for everyone who's joining in because of the other webinar, it's it's all good because I know it ended a little bit late, so there's always some people like joining in from that. Um, so the, the disclaimer, just just disclaimer that's on all like all of our presentations. Just we are not like we're not the authoritative source of truth in any of these presentations. So we we did we did our best to do our research, we did our best to make the most accurate information to present that to you all. But we're not the sole source of truth on it. So if you want to look learn more about it, obviously feel free to go on the internet learn more about it on your own. Um, so this is just a little bit about me. Um, I mentioned a lot of this in the previous presentations as well. Um, so I'm going to skip, pretty much skim through this. Um, I'm a founder of this Aegis Navigator program, and I'm a sophomore in Georgia Tech, studying computer science. And that's just a little bit about me before I get started in the presentation. So what are we going to be talking about today? And what we're going to be talking about today is Linux and Unix. So we're going to first talk about, well, 
what are we, what is Unix? What is Unix? What is Linux? What are we, what is this thing that we're talking about today? Then we're going to talk about some redirection operators. And you'll learn more about what these mean as we actually go through the, like, if you're not sure, like, what these agenda items are, we'll talk, we'll talk more about them as we get to them. Working with directories and files, text manipulations, some more, like, advanced forms of that text manipulation, and some flow control stuff, which you might, you might be familiar with from the R script presentation as well. So just to get started, we'll talk about, well, what is Unix? Unix is basically a multi-user operating system. And it's an operating system where you can have one machine, like one system, and multiple users can log in simultaneously to use the same computer to perform their tasks. And Linux is like, we'll talk more about what Linux is, but you've probably heard about Linux more, but it's also like a, an old operating system. So you know you have like Mac OS and you have uh, Windows, those are all operating systems. Unix and Linux are just another example of an operating system that computers can run. Um, since multiple people can be running on the system at the same time, you can also run multiple programs at the same time. And the, it just takes more CPU power. Just like on like a, your laptop or your phone or whatever you're watching this on, you can open up multiple apps at the same time and have them all running, all do multiple things at once. Just like that, you can do that in Unix as well. You can have multiple programs executed at the same time. It's an operating system. And that's, sort of, that's one of the main functionalities that operating systems need. It's security. like um, you clear your laptop. I'm gonna make a lot of comparisons to like your operating systems that you're used to, but you can like have account security while you're logging in. You have your passwords, file system security. You can like encrypt some of your files. So you can do a Windows as well, and network security so that while you're like on the internet, while you're communicating the different like platforms and stuff like that, you can have security in there as well. And portability. And Unix is portable. It's written in a high level language so that it can be run on a bunch of different computers. And that's one of the advantages of it over stuff like, let's say, Mac OS or Windows OS. It's really portable. It's, it can be run on like a, a wide variety of computers, really old hardware, really new hardware. All those different operating, like all, all those different machines can run Unix and run Linux. While like Mac OS is limited to Mac devices, Windows is limited to like Windows devices, there's sort of no limitations on that with Unix. And it's fast and it's easy to use uh, between like multiple computers and stuff like that. It's highly programmable. It has like all the different programming components used with the programming languages. And it's highly programmable to like customize like whatever you need to do. You can make Unix do that. And some common common Unix vendors are like you might not have heard of these, these are a little like older, like Sun Solaris, AX, HP UX are sort of like Oracle. Like these are big like tech companies and some of the ways they use Unix. But then you also might have heard of some of the Linux vendors like Ubuntu or Mint or something like that, which are Big like Linux and Unix flavors, and there's different like varieties of the operating system, but they all inherently do the same thing. So what's the history of Unix? So this is just like a really brief thing. You don't really have to know much about this. It's just sort of like a fun fact trivia type thing. Um, so in 1969, the first version of Unix was created in AT&T Bell Labs, and is developed developed by a few people named Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Rod Canada, and Doug McElroy. In 1973, it was rewritten, and it's basically rewritten mostly in C, uh, which was developed by one of the original founders, Dennis Ritchie. In 1980, they uh, Berkeley, like the university itself, um, uh, created a new Unix flavor for that for educational purposes. In 1983, there was a commercial version released by AT&T, the same AT&T that was like phones, and in 1991, Linux was originated as a free Unix-type operating system created by Linux Torvalds. And you, Linux is probably the one that you're going to be most familiar with because it's that's what's used the most in like real-world applications these days. It's Linux and different flavors of Linux. But Linux and Unix are essentially the same thing. It's Linux is just a type of Unix. So everything that we learned today can also be applied to Linux as well. So why do we need like Linux or Unix? Like why can't we use other operating systems like Windows or Mac OS that we're more familiar with? So how Linux is used is Linux is used on personal workstations. Like a lot of people actually use Linux for their personal machines. Like that's their main operating systems. When they open their laptops, they don't boot into Windows or they don't have a Mac. They have they work on Linux computers. Um, like internet service providers, they use Linux because they can have a lot of like customizability and protection with it. Like print servers, like 
actual like hardware and servers that applications run on in most like companies or anywhere that you go, these servers are going to be run on Linux. Because it's not only is it like compact and not as really easy to run, it's like really lightweight as well. So it's really great for servers. And Turkey systems are just like another type of like server. And why do they use that? It's because, well, first of all, it costs less. You don't have to pay for a Windows license. You don't have to pay for a Mac computer. It's free. So that's why I'm very big advantage of it. It's stable. It's reliable. It's extremely powerful. And it's open source. And the thing with that being open source is that like, people can create whatever they want for it. So companies, if they want to make their own like specific instance of Linux, they can make that because it's all open source. They can customize it to whoever they want. Mac OS and Windows OS, you can't really you don't really know what the source code of it is. So if you want to debug a problem, you have to go to Windows or go to Mac for it. Linux, you can do everything on your own, and there's such a big community around it. So one of the next things we're going to talk about is the Unix file system. So with every operating system, you obviously will need somewhere to store files or some way of storing your files. On the right, it's a little outdated of a screenshot, but it's sort of a good example of how this sort of file system compares to um, the one that most of us are used to. So what a file system is, basically the collection of files on a partition or a disk. And a partition is just like a container of files. And it can span your entire hard disk, for example. So in Linux, we have what's on the, in Linux or Unix, we have what's on the left. We have the file system or directory that looks like this. And on Windows or something, then you're more used to what's on the right. You have like your My Computer, your C drive, your documents, downloads, other folders like that. And there's a lot of similarities between them, a lot of like parallels between them. So your Unix has a sort of root directory into it. As you can see in the top, everything is in this slash directory. You have like slash bin, slash boot, slash dev, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that slash is kind of like your C drive in your computer because it contains all of your other files and all of your other directories. So just like your C drive in your computer, has everything that you need to actually run your documents or downloads, everything. Everything is in your C drive. In, Lin in Unix, everything is in your slash, um, your slash directory. And each one of your file systems has no sort of dependency between the other. And they have, and Unix has some like sort of specialized directories. Like, I don't know if you've done, in like a Windows laptop or something, you have like app data or something like that, where you have like certain like application or program information. Unix is a similar thing to that, where you have like slash bin, for your sort of commands, your executables, temp for temporary files, and dev for like device files or hardware files you wouldn't really need to use on like an ordinary basis. And then in Unix, what are the sort of file types that we have? So this might look like, uh, like a little complicated for now, but basically what this means is when you're working with a file in Unix, since you have a lot more control over what each file can do or what each file can be used for. So each file will show up like if you um, if you like look at a file in, in Unix, you can actually find like the permissions for that file. The permissions looks kind of like this. Basically, you have the first thing that shows up is what the type of file is. It can be like just a normal file, a directory, and some of these other ones are like a little bit more complicated. You wouldn't really need to know, but the main the big ones are like your regular files and your directory. So it'll either be a dash or a D. Then the next thing shows like, hey, whatever user you current are, like, are you logged in as you? Are you logged in as like, your dad? Are you logged in as admin or a school admin or something? Does that user have read, write, or execute access? So read, write, execute means can you like look at the file? Like if it's a text file, can you like open it up and see what's inside it? Write means can you add stuff to that file? And execute means can you run it? So like, can you open up, like, can you like read this text file? Can you write more stuff to that text file? And executable is like, let's see a Google Chrome. Are you allowed to run Google Chrome or are you not allowed to run Google Chrome? And then every single person, like a user, you can see, do they read, write, execute? The next thing is like your group itself. Like, are you, if you're in your school or something and you're a member of like the student group, can your student group entirely have permission to read, write, or execute? And then others is just everyone else, everyone who's, not you and not in your student group, then what, what access do they have? Do they have read, write, execute access? And if not, like what do they have? And the way you sort of see this is you run this command ls minus lt. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But when you run this command, you can just see, okay, which one of these files has like read, write, execute access? 
what, so this first dash obviously shows you that these are all three files. The next thing, um, do I read write access? Yeah, I read write access for all of them, but I don't have execute access. Does my group have read write access? Yeah. And everyone else, everyone else can just read it. They can't write it or execute it. So that's sort of what I meant by this. So Unix is like Unix and Linux, they're operating systems, kind of like Windows and Mac, like I mentioned a lot of times before. And the Unix operating system is sort of made of three parts. When you're working with like Windows or Macs, you don't really think about this because all of this is like done for you. But Unix is a lot more hands-on. It's a lot more customizable. So you have to like, if you want to think about it in that sort of more customizable mindset, you have to know like, what is it sort of made out of? So your first thing is, is you have your computer hardware. You have like the actual like physical like machine that you're working on. The next thing is, is what's called the kernel. And you don't really have to know what the kernel is. Just think about it as the layer between the computer hardware and the actual like shell or whatever you run your commands on, or like the actual interface of your computer or operating system itself. The kernel is just the platform that it acts between those. And then you have your kernel, your shell, and your application programs. And all three of these together, the, the kernel, the shell, the application programs form what's called your operating system. So the same thing applies to sort of Windows and Macs, just in a, there's a different kernel or shell, like operating system for all of those. So the operating system designer works on the computer hardware. So the person who's making Windows, person who's making Mac, person who's making Unix, they work on the computer hardware and they make the operating system from the ground up. People who are programmers, like the programmers who want to write apps, like let's say they want to write, they want to code Google Chrome, or they want to code um, like Notepad, they want to code PowerPoint, they want to code this browser they own right now. They work on the kernel and the shell. That's where their programming is done. That's where their code, everything, that's where their code lies. And the end user, which is just you, when you double click on Google Chrome or when you run a program, that's that's where application program is. That's what you are the end user of the operating system. You don't want to have to deal with programming everything. You just want to be able to run the apps that the programmers made on the operating system the operating design, operating system designer made. And this is like a hierarchy of that. So now we've gone over like what is Unix? Like what is Unix? What is it about? So now we're gonna go over redirection operators in Unix. So redirection operators. So redirection, all these operators are basically commands that you run in Linux. So Linux, unlike a lot of different operating systems, I can actually show this right here. Um, it's not really like you don't there's no like interface for it. There's no like, but you can get graphical interfaces for it. But a lot of it is done just by commands. And commands is how you do everything in Linux. Everything in Unix and Linux is just done by typing in commands and having stuff happen. So um, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but like let's say this is a sample place where you can um, like run some commands. Like let's say you want to run ls, like the command that I ran, talked about before, or ls minus lt. I'll talk more about what these ls files, like ls command does, but essentially this lets you, um, let me actually increase the font for this. Yeah, so essentially here, ls minus lt, which is what I mentioned before, lists ls just lists all the files in your directory so right now i have this command.txt unix1.txt a bunch of text files in this directory and what all since everything in unix is done by commands what i'm going to be talking about for the next few slides and for like a majority of the presentation is just commands that you can run and what those commands do so the first thing with redirection is um like how do you like put things, like how do you pipe things into, into objects and how you take things out? So ls minus lt, essentially what it does, like, like I showed you before, is if I type in ls minus lt, it shows me all the files that I have in my current directory and what those, and what those files are, what permissions do they have. And let's say I, I wanna put that file into something. Like I, want, I don't wanna like just look at it on my command prompt, I wanna put it into a text file. That's where this ha that's where this command goes. So ls minus lt, then this greater than symbol, into a new file, puts whatever this output is 
let's say else minus lt greater than symbol into let's say file three then cat which lets me like read a file file three shows me whatever i just looked in so it took whatever output came from this command and then piped it sort of like took the output and redirected it into this file three and i can now see in file three there's all this new information that was from the output of that previous command that's a lot of what these redirection operators do. They take input or output from a command or put them into a command, and they do different functionality based on that. So the next one is sort of input. So cat input, like the lesson sign is input, file three, means takes the file three, and it's like almost like an arrow pointing into cat. And so it's the same thing. If you're taking cat file three or cat input file three, it does the same thing. It just prints out whatever information is in file three. Append, um, for those of you guys who don't know, append basically just means it adds it on to the end of. So let's say you have a file that has like one, two, three, and you append four. Now the file has one, two, three, four in it. So that's what that's what append does. Um, two, um, two and then the greater than symbol is actually a pretty unique case. So let's say you're running a, let's say, let me actually show this here. So let's say you have, let me clear this screen. So let's say right now in my directory, I run ls and I can see all the files I have. I have command.txt, file three, a bunch of different files. But what I don't have is a file five, right? So if I don't have a file five, then when I run ls, uh, when I run cat file five, if I try to print out what's in file five, obviously it throws an error because, well, there is no file five. So what if I want to take that error, like let's say when I'm running a command, I want to take that error and print it to something else. I can run cat file five and then two greater than, and that print takes the error and then puts it into, let's say, I want to make a error. And then if I cat error, it says, hey, um, no such file directory, the same error that showed up as above. So that's a pretty unique case, and it can be useful when you're trying to like debug programs and stuff. And the last thing is if you do greater than an and, and that basically does both output and error. So if like there's an output and an error that you want to print out, you can use greater than and and do that. So that's sort of the redirection operators. Now let's say we want to work with directories and files. So working with directories, you have PWD. PWD basically stands for present working directory. It's like, where am I working in right now? So PWD is home MDL hall. So actually, just to explain this, let's say you have like my file explorer. Like right now I'm on Windows. So I obviously have like a file explorer where all my files are, right? So if I want to take this file and I go to like my desktop, then I know that desktop is where I am. So where am I currently? That's what PWD shows. It shows where am I currently at in this sort of like file structure that I'm working with. Am I in documents? Am I in downloads? Like where am I? Um, make directory. So MKDIR stands for make directory. And essentially what it does is just makes a new folder. You know, like usually like a right click, make new folder. That's what make directory does. And you can do like make directory, a PROG or make directory, it's case sensitive because like, you know, as when you name folders, you can have two folders with the same name. You can have two different folders that have like different capitalization. You can have program with all capitals and program with lowercase and all two different things. And then once you want LS minus LT to see like what files are there, you can have the new directories show up. Remove directories lets you delete folders. So you can make your directory and then remove it afterwards. And then RM minus R, it's like similar to, it's like remove recursively. So it takes the, the RM minus R basically, instead of just removing the folder, it removes the folder and everything that was in the folder as well. CD lets you change directory. This is like, this is the command you're gonna use a lot if you're working with Linux. So change directories, like in, in Windows, you can just like click, okay, I wanna go to documents, I wanna go to downloads, I wanna go wherever. In Linux, you have to use CD to move around. CD is a command you use almost all the time like cd is very important and then ls just lets you like print out hey where am like what am i working with what list list all the files in whatever directory i'm working with so just like 
So some examples with this. Even further. I just want to make sure my font's big enough for you guys to see. So let's say I run ls. I have a bunch of just files right now. Let's say I make directory um, programs. Now, as you can see, programs is in blue because it's a, it's a folder. The folders, at least in this instance of Linux, show up as blue. So now, if I want to say, I want to go into programs, change directory, and the name of the folder, programs. And now, there's nothing in here because I'm in programs. So now I can um, go CD. If you want to go out, you do CD dot dot, and that goes out one. So you can go into a folder with CD and CD dot dot to go out of the folder. And now I'm out. And I can just say, I want to, hey, I don't want to get rid of this. I misspelled it or something. RMDIR programs, and it's gone. So that's sort of like, the ways you can like manu like manipulate files and create new folders and stuff like that. Now working with files. Before we were working with directories, now we want to work with files. So touch. Touch is how you make a new file. So touch file one basically makes a file called file one. MV is sort of like renaming files. It's move it's it's technically moving files, but let's say you do MV file one file two, that will basically rename file one to file two. CP is copying files. So you can copy whatever's in file one to file two. And that'll just like basically copy whatever information was in file one over to file two. And if you notice at the end of these, we have ls minus lt file star. And basically that just prints out everything in our directory that has like file in it. So it's just, it's just showing, all right, if I made this change, and I do run ls, I can see what that change made, like what changes I made to the folder. RM, just like we said before, we had RM directory. Now just RM removes files. And find and locate. Find and locate is pretty is really, really useful as well. Because let's say you don't know where you like you made a text file, but you forgot where you put it. If you forgot where you put a text file, how do you find it? Instead of like trying to like CD into everywhere and find where that file is, you can just run find. And then in slash, which is like your home directory, dash name, and then whatever file you want to find. Or you can just run locate whatever file name you want to find, and that'll find it for us. It's kind of like in um, in Max, you have like Finder, or in Windows, you have like the search bar in like your bottom left. It's kind of similar to that, except you can just find whatever name you want in whatever directory you want to look for. So let's say I go back to this sort of Linux instance that I have, and um i want to like let's say i want to touch i want to make a new file called program now as you can see this there's a new program file that's made and i can let's say i, I want to name it actually i want to name it all caps so now program is renamed to this program and so now i have like program my program i can rename it and now if I want to get rid of it, I could do rm program, and that get rid gets rid of it. But on the, if you want to be on the safe side, let's say I touch the program file again. Sometimes you want to be on the safe side. You want you don't want to be able to remove files that you don't actually like need to remove. So it's always a good idea to run rm with this dash i tag. When the dash i tag, what it basically just means is interactive. So it tells you, hey, are you sure you want to remove this file? And if you're sure you want to remove this file, you type in yeah, Y or yes, and then it removes it. If you type no, then it doesn't remove. So now we're going to talk about text manipulation. So now we can like make files, we can make directories, we can move around and stuff like that. So now how do we make text files? How do we actually do some text work with this? So text manipulation, working with text, the first thing that we have is um, grep. And grep is like very, very useful in Linux. It's one of the commands you run the most when you're running these commands. And grep, what it basically, it stands for global regular expression print, which sounds really complicated, but the actual functionality of it, functionality of it on a basic level is pretty simple. So grep basically just finds instances 
of whatever you're trying to find in an Indian file. So let's say you have like a text file with a bunch of different words in it and you want to find your name or you want to find a specific word. And normally you run like command F or something like that on, a, on like a Windows or a Mac to like find something in a file. Well, grep lets you do that as well. Grep lets you take like grep, whatever you want to find, let's say you want to find Unix in this file called unix.txt. Then I'll look everywhere in that file and find whatever instance of Unix that I want. And then these sort of like parameters you can add, all, uh, almost every command in Linux has these sort of parameters on it. Whenever you see a dash or a dash dash, that lets you that tells you it's a separate parameter you can add onto it. And dash i, what that does is it lets you ignore case, because this is usually case sensitive. So if you have like Unix spelled with all capitals, then this wouldn't show it, but dash i would show it. Um, dash l lets you print out like file names. So instead of like looking for text within a file, let's you search for files within like your directory. And grep basically just lets you search text in files. WC is word count. So that's like pretty self-explanatory. It gets you the word count of the file. Then you can add like the parameter dash L to the number of lines, um, dash W for the number of words. And it counts everything from like lines, words, and characters. Sort lets you just sort files. So sort unix.txt basically sorts the contents of the file in alphabetical order and it's like line by line. And then sort dash r just does the same thing in reverse. It does it in reverse alphabetical order. Unique, um, well, that's it's like, it's pronounced unique, but it's like basically what it is. is it lets you get the unique lines in a, in a text file. So unique unix.txt prints out all the unique lines. So you have like, hi, my name is Mayhar. Hi, my name is Mayhar. Hi, my name is Joshin or something. Then that lets you, that, that just says, it removes all the unique lines, only prints each unique line once. So if you have a bunch of names, you want to say, hey, how many unique names are there actually in this? Then it actually just prints out those names, those unique names right there. And then unique dash D only prints out duplicate lines. So it does the opposite of it. Instead of only showing the ones that are show up once, it shows up only the ones that are duplicated multiple times. And then unique dash U is the same thing as unique. It's just if you want to add the dash U to like make it more readable or something. And then cut is a little more complicated, but it what it essentially does is it's something I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you guys more what it does and make more sense when like I'm actually showing an example of it. But it cuts out characters from a text file. So cut dash c cuts out the character. It goes character by character. And it cuts out the second character of each line in Unix.txt. Cut dash c one to seven cuts out the first to seven characters. And then dash f does it by fields, and then dash d chains like the sort of delimiter of it. So th this one is like a little, a little hard to show. So I'll show an example of this. So right now I have this this file. So if I want to see what's in the file, like I mentioned before, you do cat Unix one dot text. So this is just sort of like a sample file that was there. And it has a bunch of these different words in it. And let's say I want to I want to find grep. Grep is like basically like searching. So search for Unix in this file, unix1.txt. Nothing showed up. Why did nothing show up? Because in every instance here, as you can see, Unix is capitalized. So now I want to ignore case. So grep dash i for ignore case, Unix in unix1.txt. And here, look, it highlighted every instance of Unix that I wanted to see. That's pretty cool. Now, let's say I cat this unix1.txt again. And now let's say I only want the second character from each, um, I only want the second character from each line. What I can do there, uh, okay, what I can do there is cut, or actually let's see, let's say, that, let's say I want to find a word count of unix1.txt. It'll show me like the sort of like lines, words, and characters. So there's like nine lines, there's 66 words total and 363 characters in this. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, there's nine lines, two characters, three hundred sixty-three word um, characters. Let's say I want to print just the unique lines. 
it's unique unix one.txt it'll print these are like the unique lines um, and then let's say i want to cut so let's say cut dash c to unix.txt what this does is cuts and the second character from unix unix.txt and it prints that out so you see it's n n n n n n n space n n space n n space why does it do that because the second character is n n space n n space n n space the second character is n n space in all of them and if i want to do the first to seventh character i don't know just randomly cut for the character unix text and it prints out the first to seventh character of each one so unix is unix is i love unix is unix is unix is it's like some pretty convenient things that you can do it there's a lot of different applications for it all right so now we have the pipe symbol and the pipe symbol is like one of the most important things within um within like sort of unix and it's one of the most important things to like learn and the pipe symbol is basically used to move data between commands and it works as like a pipe it takes whatever like let's say you run this command here it takes whatever output you get from this command and it pipes it into this other command and it can use to sort of link together commands to form like really complex tasks that would otherwise take multiple steps and the symbol for pipe is this this is this like um I don't even know what that symbol is. I always call that symbol the pipe. I don't know what it is, but it's usually above like your enter key or keyboard. But that that's the pipe symbol. And the pipe symbol just takes whatever like whatever command, let's say run ls minus lt, and I pipe that output into something else, and I can grep. So I say I list my directory. Now in that list of my directory, find find Mayor. Find a file with a name Mayor, or find any anywhere in that thing where it mentions Mayor. And then if I find that file, then sort it. And if I sort the list of that files and find the unique ones. So it's like you can pull together a lot of the commands that we had before and do really some really powerful like chain effects from it. That's basically like the power of pipe. And pipe is used a lot in like a lot of different applications. And like its limitations basically only limited to like what you can imagine. You can just pipe any any command into any other command. And see how that sort of output works, and see how it can work for you. Um, next, you have head and tail. And so, head and tail is basically if you're working with like really, really, really large files. Let's say you have a file that has like a thousand lines on it or something. Then you you don't want to be able to like if you cat that file. Like if I if I look here, and if I have let's say. Uh, what is what is in C server.log? So there's like a, a bunch of different things that come up here. And let's say like this log file is like 200, 200, maybe even a thousand lines long. I don't want to look at all of those different lines. I don't want to have to look at every single diff different individ individual line within that. So instead, what I can do is I can call head or tail. And head with a file name only shows the first 10 lines, or you can specify as many, however many lines you want with this like dash n option. And tail shows you the last 10 lines of that option. So let's say you have like a server.log, like I mentioned show before. If you want to see the first um, first like 10 files, you just do head server.log. And if you want to see the last 10 lines, you do tail server.log. If you want to see 20, you can change it to 20. You can pipe in like let's say you have a directory like some of our like downloads directories obviously you have like like if you keep clicking download on a file on windows obviously like most of our downloads folders are like really 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 long we have like hundreds of files in there just like from random different assorted places let's say we want to like list out everything in that in that like directory and only show the last 10 last 10 files we downloaded you can do ls minus l or ls minus lt which will print out everything that you like every file that you have in your directory and then use the pipe symbol that we talked about before to show, let's say head, you want to show the first 10 files you downloaded, or tail, the last 10 files you downloaded. So you can do some really like powerful combinations with that, like pipe and head and tail like that before, like I mentioned before. So 
pipe all comes up a lot with a different bunch of different options, and it's used with a bunch of different commands to make sort of that chain effect you want from them. Now I want to talk about some like a little more advanced tech, tech, like text manipulation. So there, like the text manipulation we mentioned here, this sort of like wrapping word count stuff like that. It's it's really powerful, but it's like pretty simplistic in the uses that it has. Now we're going to talk about some really really powerful stuff, and this is stuff that I'm, I'm going to mention this later on as well. But it's not really stuff that I can like teach within like a, the 20 to 30 minutes that we have here, but it's stuff that I think is really important to look at. So the first thing is SED, which is a streaming editor. And it basically, it's a text, it's a way of editing text for really, really large files and really, really large data sets. And it applies, it applies rules based on what's like called a stream of data, which in most cases is just a line of data. And it applies it once per line unless we use this global argument. And it's useful for like these sort of like complex find replaces that you want to do. And this is like a disclaimer, like the streaming editor SED does not actually change the file that you're looking at. It only, it does not change the content of the original file. Like if you run SED on a file, it doesn't actually do any changes to that file. It only prints out whatever changes would have happened. So this, I'm gonna show a bunch of different operators and the way you run these operators is single quote S slash, and then you can like show however you do it from there. So SED, and then in single quotes, this is the expression that you're doing. So SED does these changes based on the expressions that you provided. So S slash, it tells you that if you're doing a substitution. You're basically doing like a find replace. Like when you do control F on your computer and you find the, file, find the information, you can replace it there. Essentially what this is doing. So this is saying substitute, so S stands for substitute. Everywhere that you see Unix in a file, substitute it for Linux. And then the slash G, what it does is, originally if you do SED, S slash, it'll only replace the first instance of Unix. Let's say you have like one line, like, um, at Unix one. Let's say you have lines like, like lines like here, where you have Unix like two times, or Unix are two or three times in them. Then you, you wanna replace every single instance. You don't wanna replace only the first one. And that's what slash G comes in. It does it globally. It applies it everywhere on that line. And SED um, for like S slash Unix, what this two does is it only changes the second one, second instance of it. So you can specify the first, second, third, however many instances, or global if you want to do all of them in the line. Next is D. And D basically just deletes lines from a particular file. So 5D, like whatever number you put before D tells you what num file, you, like what line you want to delete. So five, you want to delete the second to the sixth line. Um, P is a way of doing sort of duplicating the, the replace line, duplicating the replace line. So let's say you will, let's say you replace the line SED, like you substitute Unix for Linux. What this P operator does is it prints that duplicated line two times. It has some sort of like niche use cases some of use all that often, but if you want that functionality, that functionality is present. And then uh, if you want to print the replace line only once, you can do dash n, but it does that by default. So there's not really a, much of a use to doing dash n and, dash and slash p, but that's sort of like some functionality we want if you want there. Let me actually show some examples of this, I think that would help out. So let's say here you have like your Unix, let's see if you have your like Unix.txt here, right? You have a bunch of different times you have Unix and a bunch of different times you have Linux. So let's say we do SED substitute every single time that you do Unix, I want to make it Linux. And then slash G for doing a global. And obviously you have to pass in the file that you're like working with. So now it says Linux is portable. Linux and Linux are commands the same. Linux and Linux well done multiple servers. I love Linux and Linux. Look, it changed every single Unix instance to Linux. But if you look at the original file, nothing changed. It only changed it in the output here. And then the same thing applies to, let's say, I only want to do a second instance, then it only does a second instance. So there's some really powerful stuff you can do with that. 
the next um, sort of like advanced like text manipulation is awk. And awk is basically like, it's not something I could really teach in this short of a time because it's like almost essentially an entirely new programming language within Linux itself for just editing text files. But what it does is it's a lot more powerful than like, it's more powerful than said even because it can process fields while etcd only processes lines. And fields are essentially, let's say you have a file that has like a, like a data in it. Let's say you have like name, tab, um, last name, tab, like date of birth. And each one of those like, Separated field, separated like um, columns would be tab, would be fields. And those sort of columns or fields you can work working with like large data sets. You don't want to make changes based on line by line. You want to make changes based on fields. And off basically like scans this file, scans any file you pass into it line by line, splits it into fields, and then does these actions based on these fields. And it gets its input from like other files, or you can do like piping redirects to it. So it's like it can be combined with a lot of the stuff that we learned before. And it's useful for these like transforming data files, producing formatted reports, stuff like that. So running an off program. And so some off programs, like some simple off programs, what they can do is let's say I echo, echo basically just prints out a line to the screen. So if I like Echo hello, it prints out hello. Let's say I echo my Amir Johal grade 12. And then I awk. Awk, the, the, this, there's sort of like syntax is how you like run programs in awk. So single quotes around them and then curly braces around that. And what print dollar zero does is it just prints out whatever I sent into it. It prints out the first like entire field that I sent into it. Let's say I do print dollar one. Now it splits it, it splits this up into fields. So my name, my first name, my last name, my grade, and this uh, and like my actual grade, those are each individual fields. So it prints up the first field. And I can actually do like even more complicated things like awk print whatever name I have here is student of class, and then wherever this last ins instance is, and do I am student of class 12. And so it's like some really co like, complicated things you can do with that. And there's even more built-in variables like NF and NR, which show you like the number of fields that have, like basically number of columns, and NR being the number of rows you have. And you can do some really powerful like like text manipulation with that as well. Like here, um, as, as I mentioned before, the single quote curly braces are like the beginning and end of like whatever you're putting into it. And then print NR. NR is the sort of number of records. So this is like the first record, the second, the third, because each one of these are new lines. And then NF minus two. So NF minus two takes a number of fields or columns, which is how many fields show up here. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have seven fields and you want to print out minus two. So minus two is go one back, go two back, this 200. And then the dollar sign just prints that out and it takes in the server.log. So it says, all right, row number one, what is the minus two? 200. Row number two, 200. Row number three, go back to 200. Like I mentioned before here, like we have the different fields. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Each one is separated by a space by default. And you can print out these different, like, you can print out um, the different like number of fields, number of rows. Like NF minus two takes this second one back, so seven minus two five gets just two hundred. You can print that out. So some more examples with off is that you can print like dates. You can let's say you you say you print out a dollar two. Dollar two prints out this entire like big complicated thing as like the date and the time. We only want the date. You can actually pipe different augs into each other. And say, all right, dollar two, this second like space separated group. Um, dash F is basically just, let's say you only want this first one. So you take this dollar one, whatever this first instance is, you set the delimiter to be like the field space, like instead of separating by spaces, you separate by colons. And dollar one says, all right, everything before this first colon, which is a date, now has this like left bracket in it. You want to get rid of that? You can pipe it in again into like SED. So you can like 
combine a lot of the things that we talked about before into like one giant command. And that takes in, that substitutes every single left brace for um, a blank space. It's double slash is mean a blank space. So you first awk, awk away this entire like first field. You take everything from the left of this colon and you substitute all these braces for blank spaces. You end up with this really nicely formatted date. So that show, goes to show there's a lot of different powerful functionality you can do with this. And the last thing we're going to go over is sort of conditional flow control. I talked about this when I was talking about the R script. So if you want to like learn more about it, you can go to that slide. You can go to that like presentation as well. But flow control is essentially like if else state. It's like how do you when you're writing like code in this in the shell, how do you do these sort of like if else functionalities for that? So let's say you have two variables, a and b. A is 10 and B is 30. Actually, I actually want to see whenever A is equal to B, then print out or echo A is equal to B. So A and B obviously are not equal. 10 is not equal to 30. So nothing will print out here. Next, you have, let's say you have 10 and 30. You can say, all right, if A is equal to B, then say, then say echo A is equal to B. Well, let's say you want something else. You want to say, if that isn't true, then what do I do? So you do if, then else. And then else lets you choose that separate functionality for it. So say, if they're equal, then print out A is equal to B. Else, or like otherwise, echo A is not equal to B. And then phi is basically how you end it. So you start with if and end with phi. And the solution of the program, when you run this, it'll print out A is not equal to B. And the, the last, like, let's say, let's say you want to do even more function, like, powerful functionality than that. You want to do if, then, else if, then, like, you want to do like even more, even more like statements. You want to do else if, else if, else if, and then an else. Then you can have if a is equal to b, then print out they're equal. Else if a is greater than b, then say a is greater than b. Otherwise, say none of our conditions are met. And since 10 is not greater than 30, and 10 is not equal to 30. They'll skip past this, skip past this, and print out none condition. Um, case in ESAC is sort of like, if you learn know about switch statements, that's how you write switch statements. It's essentially just a way of doing a bunch of different if statements on a single, like, let's say you have, like, a, if you, instead of doing a, a lot of if statements in a row, a lot of, like, else if, else if, else if, and then phi, let's say you have just one parameter that you're trying to, like, find information on, say, food. You, it, you want to take in a person's favorite food, and you will print out, hey, I like this food too, or some fun fact about that food. Instead of having like hundreds of different if statements for each of the individual food, you can have cases for each of the foods, and then just break it up into that, and it looks a lot more cleaner as well. So general syntax for that is case, word in pattern one, pattern two, and with these like parentheses and semicolons as well. And then e-stack, like if you notice, like if and with phi, because phi is if backwards, same thing, case ends with esac, because esac is case backwards. So like I mentioned before, instead of having an if statement, like if food is soup, print out soup is good for health. If food is pasta, print out I love pasta. If food is pizza, print out pizza is pie is quite tasty. We can just take in this food as a case, and then for each one of these different cases, we can say, all right, if this food is pizza, then we do this. If it's pasta, do this. If it's soup, do this. And then end with esac. So now that, now that the food is soup, it'll echo, it'll go to this case and say, all right, soup is good for your health. And then just like with any other programming language, we have loops as well. So I'm um, like a lot of like a lot of this is similar to like a lot of this different stuff that we're talking about in terms of like in other like lectures as well. So I'm just gonna go over like the syntax of how you do them in Unix. So you have like while, whatever expression that you want. So if you want to do equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. It's not with like the same like caret or symbol signs because we know those are used for like redirection. So if you want to if you want to do those, you have to use these dash eq, dash any, or dash whatever one of these options you want. So you can say while dollar a is the value of this, while a is less than 10, do this. Otherwise, once that's done, then you're done. So a is zero and a is less than 10. So while a is less than 10, Print out a and add one to a. So do zero, then add one, then one, then one is less than ten. That adds one, it goes to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But then nine is less than ten. 
Well, once you add one, it's not less than 10 anymore, and it's done. Same thing with your for loops. So you have for a, if you go with a variable and a list of numbers, let's say you have four var, which is just some random like dummy variable, in a list of five, six, seven, eight, and nine. If you want to echo, if you want to print out all of these numbers, instead of going echo five, echo six, echo seven, echo eight, echo nine, or if your list is like hundreds of variables long, instead of echoing each individual one, you would say four variable in that list of numbers, then do echo whatever printout is that, and it'll go through this entire list. And once it's done, you should put the done there, and it'll end that loop there. So just to show some of that stuff off um, in this like, short amount of time that I have left, let's take a look at some of like the if-then conditionals that I had mentioned before. So let's say here I paste in some of like the, the code that I had from the slides. Um, one second. Um, let's see what's this. Okay, so oh yeah, let me paste in the code here. All right, so I have the code that I had in the slide. A is equal to 10, B is equal to 30. If A is equal to B, then say it's equal. Otherwise, if it's greater than, say it's greater than. Otherwise, no condition met, end with phi. If I run this, what happens? None condition met, because 10 was not equal to 30, and it's less than 30. It's not greater than. So it'll echo this last condition. And the same thing can be applied, like, let's say we look at like some of the, the loops as well. Show you that like the code actually works. If I like a while loop where I say a is in zero and while it's less than 10, I keep adding one. If I run that, it'll say, all right, zero is less than 10, one is less than 10, two, three, four, five, six. It'll keep adding one each time until it gets to nine. And once it adds one to nine, it's 10. 10 is not less than 10. So we get the, um, yeah, we, we don't know, we no longer print it out. And Essentially, that's a lot of stuff they want to cover at Unix. Obviously, there's so much more to Unix that, that I couldn't teach. And there's so much more to like Linux as well that I couldn't teach. There's a lot more commands, a lot of different things. This sort of an introduction to some of the basics of Linux. And you can do a lot more exploration around Linux. And if you want to actually run some of this stuff that I'm talking about here, let me actually show you that. So, there's different ways you can actually run this. And one of the easiest ways probably for you guys to run these sort of commands is a lot of you guys on your computer, and you can actually look up how to do this on like YouTube as well. If you're on a Windows computer, you have an option that's like Windows Terminal. So Windows itself, if you type in on like the search bar on your bottom left, you type in Terminal. Windows has this terminal itself that you can like run commands on. And all you have to do is go to Ubuntu. And you can Google how to do this as well. There's a lot of different videos on the internet that explain how to do this. And Ubuntu is just a different, like it's a different version of Linux. So any Linux commands you want to run can work on Ubuntu. Like let's say I want to run ls. Let's say I want to run my like cat commands. If I want to run like any different commands that I want to run, if I want to run any of the code that I had from before. Let's say I pay, I want to paste in some of the code from here. The code can run here. So that's one way of doing it. And if you're on a Mac, like Unix, is, Unix and Linux is actually built into your terminal as well. So you don't have to worry about any of that. It's, you don't have to worry about any of that. And you can also run instances of like the of your code on. So what I'm running on here is actually an EC2 instance from AWS. And I don't really have time right now to show you how to do that. But if you search up like how to run Linux commands on your computer, there's tons of different tools available on how to do that. You could do it right via the terminal that I mentioned before. If you're on a Mac, you can actually just run it on your command prompt, just, just like flat out like that. Or you can search up like Amazon EC2 instances and learn how to like use actual Amazon resources to run these Linux commands, run this like Linux server for yourself. So there's tons of different ways to play around with that and tons of different end user resources you can use for that. And I think that just about does it for my presentation here today. Um, if you guys have any questions, please, um, as always, feel free to send any send any questions to the YSV2022 at hsnavigator.org um, to uh, 
to the the YSP 2022 like at hnavigator.org email. And if you don't have any more questions, then we'll end this here for today, and we'll move on to if you guys will meet me in the next like webinar. We're going to be talking about some really cool, useful websites just for like a few minutes, and just like some really cool, useful websites you can use to protect yourself. Some cool PDF tools you can use, and just some really fun websites to play around with in your free time. So that's it for this webinar for today. I'll let you guys go, and we can meet in the next webinar, which is like a alumni panel of web tips. But today it's going to be web tips.